Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Another episode, Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. Well, here we are in March. And you know, I usually do not timestamp these episodes, but March is when we really pay attention to women who are and who have done some amazing things. Their footprint will always be in, in history. And with with these podcasts, we are able to make their voices evergreen. So this, you know, buckle up. This is going to be one fantastic episode. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about women of grace, women who have a voice even past 70. Yes. Have you looked around? Have you noticed how many boomers there are? at any given time on the, our freeways and the laundry mats and the dry cleaners in the grocery stores. Let me give you a few stats. As of 2018, there were 52.4 million Americans over the age of 70. That comes to one in seven Americans. I tell you, we are there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that one, and I forget where that public where that stat came from, but according to AARP, as of 2025, there will be one in four drivers over the age of 65. So you're not getting rid of us. We have stories. We have life. I'm 68. I am looking forward to getting into 70. And because when you meet these ladies, you're going to understand you have a lot to look forward to and you have some golden nugget stories that need to be told. Today, we are going to talk with these ladies about the isms, racism and ageism. So it, buckle up, a lively conversation. And ladies, let me introduce you to the world. <laughs> I want to introduce Mrs. Sharon McKinney. Sharon, raise your hand. I'm here. Mrs. Jackie Patterson. Oh my goodness. And Francis Pitt. These ladies have known each other for a long time. So yes. we're not just talking, ta having a conversation uh, with professionals who, who um, just met each other. These women know each other's story and journey. So that makes it so amazing. So without further ado, let's just jump right into racism. At one time, all of you ladies lived in Wisconsin. And coming from being a mid Midwesterner myself, I understand the um, racism that just sleeps there. It growls there in Wisconsin, in mm. Illinois, in the Midwest, in these United States. So I want to take it on back. You ladies are, are educated ladies. You are educators, administrators, instructors, and climbing that corporate ladder, and I always call the school system a corporation, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I understand that there were things that you all had to overcome to do what you were to do. Mm -hmm. So who wants to lead this conversation off? Was someone transparently, and you don't have to call the name of a person or maybe even a school or institution, but will somebody lead us off? and share your story of, of racism and how it stopped, tried to stop you from becoming the administrator, the teacher, the instructor that you grew to be. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jay. I'll, I'll start, Margo, because um, okay. mine goes back quite a ways. Uh, you know, my mother was um, mixed. She was half white, half black. And so in our household, mama said, you treat everybody you know, you don't do that. My daddy said, you black, you need to know that because some stuff is going to happen. <laughs> but I didn't realize how serious racism was until I started seeing people would call my mama white and then they did the color thing with me. And I couldn't understand that. I come home and cry and mama said, don't worry about it. Don't pay any attention to them. I remember getting to college and I started doing an essay and I started asking all of the college kids, the black students, how many of you were referred to go to college. How many of your counselors encouraged you? I got just a handful. I mean, for the most part, the counselors discouraged them from coming to college, let alone encouraged them. 
or even help them. Um, I re, you know, and I'm just thinking of things. I remember mm -hmm. a college professor saying, um, he gave me a C. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why did I get a C? He said, well, you write very, very well. He says, you write as almost as well as some of my white students. <laughs> he said, but I could not give you that grade, mm -hmm. you know, their grades. And, you know, it's just things, you know, we came up through the 60s. So we know, you know, the riots and all of this. And we began, I began to see, you know, this whole thing called color. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't much even about your nationality as much as your color. If you showed up and they saw your color, yeah, then they made all of these assumptions and things happened from that point on. So that's where, you know, my history came in. My mother was light skinned and um, I was brown. Then God has a sense of humor. So I had a child that was blonde hair, blue eye. <laughs> and so she carried me and they looked at us like, is that her child? And God gave me one and I carried him and they said like, who is that? What is that? Her child. So it was the <laughs> color difference mm -hmm. that I began to start to see. We dealt with this thing called race. That's that's fascinating. Growing up in the '60s, yes. And did you, Jackie? Did you grow up in Wisconsin, in the Midwest? Racine, yeah. Racine. Born and raised in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. And and see what happened <clears throat> when um. Well, Jackie and I met each other in. A uh, Platteville, um, a small town, you know, that's in Wisconsin. And what happened to me is that I, that was the first time that I really, you know, we always knew about racism, but it was the first time that I really was like, it was in my face because I, I was always, but was taught, you know, to treat everybody as, you know, as, they are, no matter what color you are. And, um, but this was different because there was a, a racial barrier. And uh, I remember that, that when I first went to, I, the only reason why I went to Platteville was because uh, there was, I had a pro, uh, librarian that I met in high school well, she ended up going to the junior high school, I mean, the junior college I went to, because I went to a junior college before I came to, went to Platteville. She was really instrumental and, and uh, very important as for me getting into Platteville. Now, here's this lady. She had no children. She just took an interest of, you know, to get me into school, because I had said, I want to go to school. I said, I don't care what I need to do, but I'd like to go. And so her name was, um, oh, I can't even think of her name now. And, but she was in, instrumental me going to school when I, so at the time of uh, this, all this different, the, the racial uh, situations that happened, started happening, um, I, I had to, uh, really, I guess I guess I had to just say, now listen, you're black, you you do what you need to do, and and no matter what, uh, that I still was a representative of myself as I was to my family and to everybody else that was on campus. And then when when uh, we had we got permission, and I think that's what happened. We got permission um, when we had to do student teaching uh, that we were allowed to go to Milwaukee to do our student teaching. Well, that was like, cause we were off campus, but they provided a supervisor. They provided, a, 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 um, <laughs> they provided us a school we were to go to, which was an, an inner city school. And um, which if I'm telling you, if you don't learn anything else, you, <laughs> you get an education just in the school. And then, um, uh, well, to make a long story short, is that we got permission. Now, people would say, well, how did you guys get to do that? We asked. And if, so I found out if you don't ask, if you don't get, if you, if you don't ask, 
People are not going to say, oh, by the way, you can do this. No, you needed to ask. You need to have a goal of what you wanted to do. And we knew we didn't want to, we didn't want to be, um, and I'm talking about Jackie and I, we didn't want to be, uh, uh, have all of our student teaching uh, experiences in this rural area because that's not where we were going to be going. I knew that I wasn't going, uh, was not going to be on a farm in a rural area. So we asked permission. Can we, can we have our student teaching done at an inner city, at a, a city, inner city, uh, because those are the children that we are going to, and they gave us permission. Well, you know, I have a quick question, and this is fascinating. This was in the 60s, correct? Or right. was this one in the mm -hmm, 70s? In the 60s, latter 60s. So Platteville, Wisconsin, real small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you all had the grit and gumption to ask, can we go to Milwaukee and teach? We'll do it in the inner city. Is that what mm -hmm. right. you said? Yes. Yes. Right. And they said yes. They had never allowed that before. <laughs> they had never allowed it. Nobody I asked. I don't know if no one asked or what, oh, but they, they never allowed mm -hmm. it. And we literally fought for that. We said, clearly, this is not where we want to teach. And if we're going to do our practice teaching, let us go somewhere where we want to, uh -huh. you know, teach. That, that's saying something. I mean, <laughs> ask, ask, mm -hmm. ask. Oh my goodness. You never know nothing if you don't ask. You know, well, if we could, if you all could ask, then we definitely better push and shove and keep and continue to ask <laughs> these days. Oh my wow. goodness. I want to hear from Francis and then we're going to circle back around. Once you all got to Plat, once you all got to Milwaukee and you started moving about in your careers, I want to hear about something that may have come up during that climb, the, the climb up. But Francis, what would, where, what's your first memory of the single racism? Well, see, I'm from North Carolina. I'm not a Midwesterner. I migrated here, as they say. But I came from a, a farm, a rural area in a place uh, near Durham, North Carolina. My family owned a farm that had been in our family since 1868. So... <laughs> So I came from that type of uh, background, about 300 acres of land, tobacco, cotton, peanuts, soybeans, mm -hmm. cows, pigs. Uh, we had that on the farm. But at an early age, I noticed we were uh, an owner, but everybody else was sharecropping. And I could see the difference in the home. So I, was, I would always ask my daddy, Daddy, why is that house looking like that? Uh, why don't they, why aren't they wearing shoes? You know, I would, as a kid, I guess mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, I could see the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I noticed was um, on a farm, they're much like slavery to a certain extent uh, with the new name. The people work from 6 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. at night in the fields right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, in the morning, you get a break where you would go to like a corner store and buy snacks for the workers and they would have about 15 minutes break. I would go with my daddy to the store to purchase whatever he was purchasing. And then uh, I would see the other people in there buying stuff, but they could not write or read. So they were putting X's on they buy, let's say 10, 20, 30 dollars and put an X beside their name, but mm -hmm. the storekeeper would put like double the price. You know, it was all at his at his doing. So uh, at a young age, I saw racism, I saw housing accommodation, and I saw how everybody was separate, black and white. I saw the uh, signs that said colored only, white only. I'm mm -hmm. not all that old, but I did see it. So uh, that's what I grew up around that. And we had a family that was very determined. It was traditional that we worked on that farm until you were 18, but everybody was expected to go to college. Mm -hmm. So three of us, it was six of us, three went to college, three did not. And then I went to undergraduate at a historical black college, uh, worked for a dean. Somehow she sent me uh, to fill out an application to come to Milwaukee. 
So instead of firing me for sleeping on the job, she came <laughs> back with catalogs of three universities. And she said, see if you can't fill these out. I filled them out. And within uh, two or three months, I was at UW-Milwaukee in graduate school. So praise the Lord, that's how I got here. Uh, Somebody saw something in me that I didn't see in myself because I figured four years was enough. I had no intentions of going on to graduate school, but I made it through, I made it here. I had planned to stay two years. I'm sorry about that phone, can't get to okay. it. We'll keep on. Oh, no, I thought it was. I thought it was me. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, my intention was to stay two years in uh, Milwaukee. And I, I must say it's been almost 50. Mm -hmm. And I've had three successful businesses that I would mm -hmm. have never done had I stayed on the East Coast. I started an outpatient mental health clinic. I did Francis Pitt and Associates Speaking Industry. And I did what I do right now is Francis Pitt Speaks. And that has led me to various states and various countries presenting. And my most recent was speaking in London 2019 in June. And again, mm -hmm. back 2019 in November, speaking to the World of Women Conference of all things. Yeah. All right. uh, it was like 47 continents, no, 47 countries were represented, mm. 1,500 Black women, I mean, all colors, all tone, and each day I was there, I never felt like I was walking, it felt like I floated every day wow. on the okay. energy of the people that I met and got a chance to hang out with, talk with. Mm -hmm. and uh, get a chance to know what was going on in their lives. And we shared what was going on in our lives. Yeah. So from the That's cotton field to go. going to London to be in a World of Women conference that had 1,500 Blacks, and I think it was 47 countries that were represented at that conference. What a blessing. That's, wow, that's great. Had you yeah, not, that's she, great. Mm -hmm. woman had, had she not sown into you um it you never would have made it out of the carolinas perhaps or who right knows where you i never would because i had no thoughts about leaving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. jackie i'm thinking had you you know i mean there was nothing to say that you maybe would not have gotten out of racine racine is a, is a small city in in wisconsin were you always set to leave racine or what were your thoughts no i am um... I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to just stay there. I had a, I had a high school, the reason I did that survey, I had a high school uh, counselor that had gotten me a job at the telephone company. I didn't want to work at nobody's telephone company. He got, he had gotten all the black girls jobs at the telephone company. And I told him I didn't want to work there. He was mad. <laughs> he would not sign for me to go to college. Mm. Wow. That's so, upset. but I told him I just didn't want to work at there. So I actually went into college on probation. I was just determined. And um, yeah. I got in there and the guy let us in. He wasn't going to even let us in, but he let us in. And he, uh, and when we graduated, it was me and another girl. And when we graduated, he said, I got to talk about these two people that I let in on, you know, on, on probation. They came out here and they did this <laughs> wonderful thing. And so that's how my life has been. You know, it's not necessarily, it's always been a dare. I don't think you can do this. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the best motivation. I, every time I got another degree, I sent that college, I sent that my counselor an invitation. Come on, I'm, I, I'm a master's degree. Come uh -huh, on. Uh -huh. you know, I'm now assistant superintendent. I want you to come on now. I want you to, yeah. I just, and that's why I asked other people, did you even get help? You know, did people even promote you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and when I went on, like with Francis, you know, various areas in the school system, a lot of people would come to me and say, well, you know, Jackie, I really want you to do this. I said, no, no, no. Well, I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be an assistant. I, they asked me to be an assistant principal. And I said, no. And the, and the superintendent said, well, look, I'm not putting these names in until midnight. Mm -hmm. You got until midnight to call me. And I called him. No, it was principal down. And I called him and I said, if I don't take this, am I just going to blow my career up? He said, yeah. I said, all right. Yep, yeah. She's frozen. She's frozen. I can't. Same happened yeah, when I was at the state level. Uh, I, yeah. 
Am I frozen? Am you I frozen? Of, yeah, you got it frozen, but you, I think you thawed out by now. <laughs> my, my internet is unstable, you know. Yeah. But, you know, and then because of that, always said, if, if God wants you to do something, don't say no. It's true. That is true. Because he'll take you through it. Yes. And I mean, he has slapped me along these years and, you know, that he'll is take true. you through it. If he puts you there, he'll take mm -hmm. you through it. Makes a way for you to do what you're supposed to do. He just what you're supposed to do. Because he's going to use you yes. right. for his and provide. That, that's right. Yeah. For his purpose. Uh, I know for our first clinic, we had an outpatient mental health clinic was my first business. And we needed a psychiatrist, which we didn't have. We needed a psychologist, which we didn't have. But somehow our minister connected us with a, get this, a Christian psychiatrist. Okay. Who agreed yeah. to work with us. And we were so young. I think I was like 27 and my partner was 26. And he said, well, I don't know what you young ladies are planning to do, but I support you. I will help you in whatever way you need it. Mm -hmm. And this man uh, stuck by us the entire time, made sure we had that psychologist every month for 25 hours. He was there for his 10 hours. I mean, it just showed up what we needed. So that's, that's right. how God works in our lives. As my friend always say, you take one step, God takes 10. That's true. But you got to be out there doing your part. That's right. And then mm -hmm. I believe the law of attraction comes in, yes. pulls you exactly what you need, mm -hmm. the people you need, and everything to be successful. Yes. And, and when I think of Sharon and Jackie, and there's another friend that's with them, but I have told a story about them that they don't even know I've been telling for 20 or 30 <laughs> years. I rode with them to Chicago for a transitional service for Tina Bug's mother. But what I noticed about these ladies in the car, they were all high achievers, mm -hmm. but no one tried to out talk the other. No one tried to outshine the other. And each one of them took times talking and listening to each other. And I came away that night saying, those are the type of people I want to be around <laughs> for the rest of my life. Great achievers, nice to each other, respecting each other, grounded, but doing fantastic things in the world. So that's how I see Sharon. That's how I see Jackie and the other young lady. Her husband is attorney. What's her name? Teeny. 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 The third one. They were just God given to me as an example of how friendship could be along with your professional life as mm -hmm. well. I, th I think that uh, they really are God given. Um, uh, there are, you know, there are people that uh, look at you and say, well, like, and just like, well, how did you do that? The Lord gave it to me. Well, how did you do this? Well, the Lord provided a way. And so a lot of it for me, it was, um, I thought being a, a teacher was, was a, really a gift. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I, I ended up doing most of my life. And then when someone said, uh, being, uh, it was going kind of slow, you know, as for um, what, how I went up was really kind of slow, but that wasn't what, because it wasn't because I didn't want to go fast. I wanted to do make sure that what I was doing for the kids I was doing, and I did it well. I, I wanted to do it well, and I don't want to get in a position that I couldn't do the work. And so um, uh, when it came to me as for, uh, well, as an implementer, well, that was working with my, with my the teachers, helping them to help our children. And, 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 and after that, then it, then it was presented to me to be an assistant. I said, oh, I don't think so. I'll just continue to do what I'm doing. But as uh, uh, encouraged by my, my friends, they said, well, Sharon, why don't you try? Uh, all right. Well, it wasn't, it was, it was, I worked under a wonderful uh, woman um, by the name of um, Martha's, uh, Martha Wheeler Fair, and she was a go-getter. 
she was, I mean, she would push you. She knew that there was something in you. It was like she was not going to let up. And so I ended up became the assistant principal, but I loved working under her. And then, um, then it came an opportunity for me to work with babies, 250 little ones that are younger, three and, and uh, three, four and five. And developed a school I had, well, I had already, wor I'm working with a school now that had three, four and five. So this was fine. And then uh, she, um, she and my supervisor suggested that I could take over this school, this another school, open, get this, open up a school. And I said, I don't think so. And, and I really did say that. I said, I don't think so. I wanna stay here. I wanna work under you. I think this is really great. And they said, well, Sharon, I really think that this is what my supervisor said. Well, I really think that you can do it. It's like, I said, I don't. And I kept saying, no, Lord, this is not your will. This is not your way. And, and the, more I, the more I thought about it, I said, well, that's like stepping out when you were talking about stepping out. And I stepped out on faith. And that was the most, that was the most fabulous experience I had had. I had it for seven years. And, and I'm telling you, at, that was just, that was a gift. That was a gift from the Lord because I had good teachers. I had wonderful students. I had beautiful parents. And, and how people were talking about having to, you know, that um, uh, I didn't have to work. I had a waiting line, a waiting, what do you call it? Uh, a wait list. Uh, list. Yeah, a wait list for students to get in. I, you couldn't have asked for better. And so I, I just I just gave it to the Lord. I said, thank you, because I had no, that was not my goal to be a principal. Right. Sharon, Sharon tell me how, how much that big school cost. Share your, your uh, experience today. I heard that it was many, many millions to build that school. It, well, it was. It I was, heard that it was five, but it probably was I more. don't know if it was that, but I do know that um, that the school, it was already had history in the right. school because apparently it was a junior high school and you know all that, but they had to redo our school to make it, uh, uh, sus, uh, uh, make it for little people. <laughs> Right. And so I don't really remember how much it costs, but I do remember that I received, every, I mean, people that I had seen uh, at a distance, they had, well, they I'd had like to say, it was yeah. probably two to five million, Sharon, from what I remember reading, but it was like a castle. It was just like unheard of in the neighbor, in the Harambe neighborhood. So what an accomplishment for you to run that particular school. Now that was, now that particular one, that was Malika, but that wasn't an MP, that was not a public school. That was okay. a private owned school. And, and yes, that was a lot of money. And, but the school that they uh, restored for me was um, 68th Street Early Childhood Center. And that was awesome. I mean, all of my experiences, I have to admit, were blessed, and and I cannot say how 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 blessed I have been in in the situations that right. I came in. Mm -hmm. And all of you all have stepped out on faith. You you oh, yeah. you counted yeah. the cost. You got out of your comfort zones, and all of you ladies are accomplished because you showed up fearful or, or whatever, you all equip yourself for where you were going. You always had that vision and you just went and you just did it. Mm -hmm. I, I commend both. I, I know all three <laughs> of you all. I, I told the folks at uh, Womel, you guys are some fantastic ladies. And as I hear the stories and as I hear of what you've done before we move on to ageism, because we only have about 15 more minutes and this 15 more minutes will go fast. Will you 
at the end, before we transition over, will you all tell, give your litany of uh, <laughs> accomplishments? And, and let's just keep it at probably five accomplishments, Sharon. We've already heard yours, uh, but let's start out with Francis, Jackie, and then Sharon. Just let the world know before you, you have a voice because you've mm. done all of this, because you've shown up and you've done these things and you've impacted lives. You've made a difference. Make mm. no mistake about it. So toot your okay. horn, pat yourself so, on the back. Oh, then let me do that <laughs> by all means. Uh, my first business when I came to Milwaukee right out of graduate school uh, was an outpatient mental health clinic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for about 10 years. And actually, I was um, looking for something new. Uh, but that was a great learning experience. And uh, to show you how small the world is, uh, I just bumped into someone. We had the opening of the America's Black Holocaust in Milwaukee mm -hmm. this past Friday. Mm -hmm. It was really, really extremely good. 5,000 square footage. And uh, so... My first job out of uh, graduate school was working in a boy's home, a private boy's home. Mm -hmm. And I was the first female they brought into the building as a psychotherapist. Uh, do you know at the America's Black Holocaust, I saw one of my students who were in the boy's home in my oh, first wow. job in 1972. And I think he's 63 now, but very accomplished. He owns this uh, janitorial business that was handling the contract for that event. He's a minister. He's married with two kids. Jackie was, uh, that's where I met Jackie at Martin yeah, Center. Yeah, we were at Martin Center. I was oh, Martin about Center. Okay. Adolescents. Yep. So I met, his name was Jerry Harris. So he was there. And how would God let me recognize this child after that many years? Mm -hmm. At least 50 years. And so I just saw them going into the workroom and I said to the owner, I want to go back there because I think I know this student. And I went back and I talked and yes, it was him. So we're going to have lunch together. But God is good yes, to see someone is. from my first adventure. I uh, took out on that first adventure, not knowing if I was going to make $5 a week, $500 a week or $5,000. Mm -hmm. But at that time, my motto for myself was, I never wanted to start a new year off at a job mm -hmm. that I did not like. So right. the new year was coming in, it was 75. And I said, I'm going, I told my partner, I'm going there. I don't know what I'm going to make, but I'm quitting. I'm not going back to that old job. So I went and I mm -hmm. was there for six months by myself. She came six months later, but her philosophy was, Oh, I have to know how much money I'm going to make and how much I'm going to have before mm -hmm. I jump out there. Right, I said, right. no, I am not going to sit back and plan for six more months. I'm trying this. And of course, things got better and we got all the help we need mm -hmm. because I stepped out on faith. Uh, after that, I did financial planning with New York Life. And that was a very a good blessing. And as a result of that, my supervisor said, you know, you always get the outstanding award for, for uh, professional speaking each year. You should be speaking. So two right. years later, of two All years right. of planning, I opened up Francis Pitt and Associates. Mm -hmm. I think that was in 1991. And we did that for about 10, 12 years, speaking nationally, uh, locally and wherever I could get an appointment, I would mm -hmm. actually speak. Mm -hmm. And because I was into a uh, new thought teaching, I knew all the universal laws and the universal plans. And those were basically my seminars. Uh, mm -hmm. One is titled the greatness you are seeking is also seeking you. Very, very good <laughs> seminar that I like. And yes, we get a lot of publicity mm -hmm. on that one. Uh, I do one called The Art of Professional Speaking and The Art of Communicating Skills. So those were the things I did right after my second job, Francis Pitt and Associates. And the third one now is Francis Pitt Speaks. And mm -hmm. that's at the time when I started to do my first international speaking. But it's been three businesses that I have enjoyed, not always a lot of success, but sometimes failure, but that was 
part of the game and I never gave up. So I mm -hmm. think I learned that from coming from a farm. You know, you got to do everything you have to do to get that crop to harvest. That's right. Life is the same way. You got to plant that seed, nurture that seed and watch it grow depending yeah. on your desire. So my desire, a question I would ask myself, which I got from Les Brown, how hungry are you to get what you say you want? All right. Lips say a lot of things with our lips, right? Mm -hmm. But the actual work is in the doing of the thing. So I had no problem working because I came from a farm where we worked from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So work was no problem for me. I knew how to do that. And I, I know you have, uh, uh, you can take this on. I know the <laughs> truth. Let me hear from Jackie and then Sharon. And we're not going to be even get into the ageism today, Jack. But I want the world, because you ladies, are, we're going to do this again. But I want the world to understand you all's accomplishments and you all's drive. And that's, the, that's how we're going to close this out. So, uh, Miss Accomplished Francis Pitt, you are the bomb diggity, as they say. I'm, I'm dating <laughs> myself, you know, it's really and truly stepping out on faith and just doing it, not really knowing how this is going to end up, but having mm -hmm. some life changing mm -hmm. uh, in influences. So, mm -hmm. Miss Jackie, Mrs. Jackie Pat. Oh, no, thank you, sweetie. But I think for me, through the 60s and dealing with all of the things that we dealt with in the 60s, the riots and, and you know, all of the stuff that was happening on the college campuses and all of the things that happened, you know, with Vietnam and the war, all of that made us stronger. When I started at uh, forced integration, we had what they call intact busing. So yes, they would take my little black kids from my school and bus them to a white school. And those little kids sure would come did. back to me at the end of the day and they said, Daddy, we didn't like that. They made us go on the other side of the playground. We couldn't have recess at the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So me being who I was, I said, you're going to tell your mom. Tell your mom and your dad. And, they did. and then the parents started calling the principal and started complaining. Mm -hmm. And he called me in his office. He said, Jackie, don't do that no more. I said, why not? So a lot of those parents got to opt out and come. So this is where the fight came. This is where we, we were, you know. So anything I did, like in the classroom, you know, I wanted to be a teacher because I wanted to teach my children that you don't settle for anything. You fight for what it is. So when I became a teacher, then I became assistant principal. I became a principal and then I, I went on and uh, worked at the superintendent's office. And then the state superintendent asked me to work for her you know, and I was over MPS, Milwaukee Public Schools at that time, mm -hmm. with state superintendent. And then as God would have it, I ended up, uh, the current governor of Wisconsin was my superintendent when I was here. Mm -hmm. So the fight never goes away. And I think God allowed us to be a part of that fight with the racism, to tell our children that there is no such thing as I can't. Right. There's, that doesn't exist. And so in every job that we've had, that is where we came from. Dude, there's no such thing as I can't. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as apathy. And I'm gonna sit around and I'll let, and I'm, no, I'm gonna say something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say something about it and I'm gonna do something about it. But as I get older, the interesting thing, I am no longer identified by the job that I did. Right. So this is ageism. So when I'm coming up and when I'm working and everything, oh, you, you, Patterson, you work here. Well, now nobody knows me. And I'm not a superintendent, assistant superintendent. I am a 73-year-old lady. Mm -hmm. And so that's another whole dimension. The 73-year-old the lady comes with all the stuff that has been a part of her 70 Take, mm -hmm. reinvent yourself mm -hmm. because mama said wherever the hands can find to do to do it. So I reinvent myself with the kids' school. I reinvent myself with my church and the community. But all of that 
is still a part of who I am. But my identity now is not based on what I right. did. Right. It's based mm -hmm. on I bring yeah. now in this 73 year old body. Mm hmm. All right. So many people need to hear that, really and truly. That is true. The job of corporate true. America is at our place of identity, and it, it really isn't. And I think COVID really showed all of us that uh, that mm -hmm. is not true. That is not right. true. Mm -hmm. We have about five more minutes. Sharon, tell us oh. about, I mean, I. I <laughs> my cousin, girl, you as you break it on down some more, you I learned some things about you that I didn't I didn't remember I or I didn't know. So you pat yourself on the back and toot your horn. <laughs> well, <laughs> the the only thing since we time is short, the only thing that I I attribute my drive to learn and to be is from a first grade teacher. I had a first grade teacher, you, and you would think like, oh, well, you know, she doesn't uh, remember that. But the first grade teacher that had taught me something, she wouldn't take, she would not acknowledge my hand. She would not, she would not uh, say, uh, uh, Sharon, what did you have to say? She didn't say that. What she, and it really, uh, what happened was I said, well, you know what? I'm going to come, I'm going to tell my mama. That's exactly what I said. I'm going to tell my mama. Mama came up very, very, very uh, uh, reserved person, but a very smart woman. And she says, I understand that Sharon is raising her hand, but no one is acknowledging her. Oh, she isn't. Oh, no, no, no. She, she knows. She said, well, that's what she said, that she had the answer, but she wouldn't be acknowledged. Well, that changed the subject because people started acknowledging me who I, that I did know the answer. And if I didn't know the answer, that's another story. But the point is, I, I, I met a person that said I couldn't do it. I met a person that would not allow me to do it. I met a person that in what she turned out was a negative, we turned out as a positive. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a student, I wanted to be a teacher that would not, uh, that would acknowledge our students, know who they are, what they are, not the color, but the color, but I, I, I have to acknowledge this is that um, I told, um, I said, I want them to know what color I am. I want them to know because, and I wanted them to, for, and to recognize because at that time there were nothing but really white, white young ladies uh, and white young men that were teachers, but they didn't know us as who we were. They just knew that they were a group of people, but they didn't know the person. And so I wanted to make a point that, that you get to know who that child is, get to know what they, what they do, what they think, know their families. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's the whole thing is that, the, that parents are not, uh, they need to be, uh, what do you call it? Yeah. Greeted, uh, brought in as Engaged. part of the child, you know? And so uh, the mm -hmm. point is, is that that's what my goal was, no matter where, what position I was asked, if I was a teacher, the implementer, the assistant principal, or the principal. And I have to share you this. I was sitting, standing at the desk, the desk of the, of the, uh, at the school, um, my, my five-year-old little boy came in and I mean, he came by, he saw that I was standing at the, <laughs> standing at the desk and there was, he was with somebody other, some other people, some, some uh, other adults. And he said, oh, that's my mom. She's the fake principal. principal. <laughs> and I said, and, but all he saw was the fact that I was working. I was working, but I, at that time, I was I was the fake principal. So the point is, is that I just wanted to know. I wanted. To, I really embraced the edu education of children, little ones, because that to me is the is uh, the beginning of building the foundation of their education. So that's all I have to say right now. 
I but it's been a, I, I, and I, and I love my, I, and I think all of us, we all love what we do, what yes. we did. And, yes. and when people say, well, what did you do at school? I, well, I taught and I loved it. It's like, oh, okay. You know, so, um, and it's not, not and, then, and I think that we were blessed with where, wherever situation, whatever position that we held, it was only a blessing because we're still here. Yes. Tomorrow, can I add to that? Mm -hmm. I say what kept us together is kindred spirits. Yes. When you hear us talk about our fight and our love for our kids and the, and the community, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. saw that in each other. And between God who put us together and that kindred spirit, mm -hmm. you still see us mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, that's true. That is so true. Ladies, <laughs> to stay in the mental health field, to build that from the ground up yes. and administer to these folks, your population for as many years as you did, and then to groom up speakers so that you could put them out into the world and Jackie and Sharon to push and stand for our kids. You guys, all three of you have raised generation, raised <laughs> a generation, a better, well-equipped population. I, I think that this is, this is <laughs> remarkable. And if we can find more women like yourselves, the world will be so much better. We would, I think there would be a lot more hope. There would be a lot mm -hmm. more grace there would be a lot more people that would feel as though I can do something else. That's right. It's my hope that people listen to this conversation and understand that after age 70, you have a voice. These are not just memories. These are bridges, <laughs> oh, no. build stepping stones that you all have, have built up. And God only knows what's next for you, ladies. Who knows? Hmm. Who knows? Well, that's true. I mean, That's he's true. brought you this far. Look at what you've done. All three of you all have fire and, and, and spit and grit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't put anything past you, ladies. So we are down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, let's see. I'm on, according to the screen, Sharon, what's uh, real quick, one final note, and then we'll hear from Francis and Jackie. Close us on out real quick. What's one final nugget that you want to leave us with? Um have a vision, work towards it, and, and apply it. Your vision. <laughs> Got you. Francis, let's hear from you. Um, I would say continue to do what you enjoy doing mm -hmm. and love doing and uh, being around people that continue to inspire you. Yes. And be a, you be a blessing to them and they will be a blessing to you and know that the, the desires of your heart uh, will be supplied. You just have to go after it and continue it. It's, I don't see any difference. I still like structure. Mm -hmm. I still like being involved, engaged. Today I was on our uh, technical college, uh, Milwaukee Area Technical College, mm -hmm. volunteering for registering the young people on campus. Oh, so great. I just keep myself doing what I enjoy doing and uh, eating good food, loving all the restaurants and, and being as happy as I know to be. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. And I just say, um, understand who's in charge of your life. That's understand right. who got you up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've learned, if you get up, then there's something you can do. <laughs> and there is, nothing, there is absolutely nothing in the world that should hold you back if you can still breathe. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's and right. Talk. There's something you can do. God didn't give you all of these so-called skills for you to sit around and, and, and uh, sew right. on the sewing machine and pretend That's like you don't have anything. So, right. you know, whatever the hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And just understand who's in charge of your life. That's right. Amen. Of grace and women using their voices after 70. You all got mm -hmm. it right here. Her business, her voice, her conversation. 
Well, it has been an eye-opening hour, to say the least. These ladies are coming back, and I'm sure that they have friends that would join them. When you reach a certain place in, in time, and you do it gracefully, and you've lived a life that is vibrant, you have so much to give to the world. Don't stop giving it out. Don't stop overflowing. As Francis said, live happily. Get your, take your happiness. Grab mm -hmm. your joy. What you know to do, do it. And plan and execute it. That's what I hear from these ladies. I hear <laughs> the passion, the life. Okay, you're 70. You're not just going to sit around. You're not just going to eat everything that's not nailed down. You're not going <laughs> to act like life really? is passion. <laughs> by, but if you do... You got a plan. But what I want okay. everybody to understand is life is so good. And if you don't see it from these ladies, then, you know, take another listen to this episode. Look into their eyes. Yeah, we had some technical problems. Who cares? The message is this, that you never lose your voice. You don't have to lose your salt. You don't have to lose your spice. You don't have to lose your fire. You don't have to do, you don't have to bow down to ageism. Don't let that happen to you because there's somebody coming behind you who needs to hear your story. They need to see your, 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 your fire. They need to draw from your well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get off that soapbox. I feel it welling up. But I'm Mark <laughs> Levette. Thank I'll you. be back next week with another episode. Thank you, Mrs. Sharon McKinney. Francis Pitt and Jackie Patterson. This has been great. <laughs> thank Man, you. And a million thank, you. thank yous. Thank you. I'll be back next week. Another episode, her business, her voice, her conversation. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Yay.